Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, <clears throat> I uh, am hosting and moderating this on my own, so bear with me, maybe. And thank you for your patience in advance. So welcome. Uh, I am presenting today on aging well, and my name is Dr. Navneer Nibber. I'm a naturopathic doctor and a medical advisor for AOR. And uh, today, I'm actually going to just get our presentation started. Um, oh my goodness, that is a very obnoxiously large disclaimer. But it's really to highlight the housekeeping items, and then we'll get into the presentation, which I assure you is much less boring, hopefully, than this disclaimer slide. So we uh, uh, have not passed this through any regulatory body. Um, the information is very much meant to be educational for you and uh, should not substitute as medical advice. And the supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, mitigate, or prevent any medical condition. There's also a little question box on the side of, right side of your screen. If you want to click on that and ask questions throughout the presentation, I will be answering them at the end. Um, but, you know, at least you can get your question in there. Um, and uh, if I look off to the side like squirrel, it's because I'm looking at your questions. I'm not just super distracted. Uh, also, what other housekeeping items? There is a handout for you um, if you suddenly feel the desire to have that nostalgic school effort and uh, take some notes along the way. Um, it is that all the contents of the presentation are in there for you. So let's get into the presentation itself. Um, a hundred years ago in March when I started developing this presentation, I really realized that we need to rethink how we look at aging and what did I want to say in this presentation that kind of hasn't already been said about aging. There seems to be a lot of discussion um, on let's halt aging, let's reverse aging, um, aging is the worst thing, it's the parasite that will take us over and we must rid ourselves of it. But really, um, that is not what I want to do today. Uh, I think what I hope to imbibe is a sense of understanding what's happening on a cellular level and on that organ tissue level as we cycle the sun. And as we get older, let's rethink aging and, and understand that we're likening our bodies to this complex machine. It's so beautiful and magical and all these things are happening simultaneously. And with any machine, you know there's a wear and tear. Um, and really what we want to be uh, aware of is how we can provide maintenance on, on this beautiful machine and what fuel it needs and what software updates. I feel like this metaphor is really getting out of control. You get the point. We are trying to uh, really understand I mean, we all age, it's an inevitability, and there's many things to be afraid of in this world, but the inevitability of aging is really not one of them. So congratulations on being here and knowing we age and wanting to know how to do it in a really nice, graceful manner. Okay, so why should you listen to me? Oh, uh. okay. <laughs> Why should you listen to me? Uh, there's there's probably some guy in the back who's always like, ah, but Nirith. Also, you can call me Nirith now because we're friends. Um, they're like, Nirith, why should we listen to you? What do you know that Google can't really tell us? And my answer is really just a boatload of schooling and clinical and industry experience. So that little piece of paper there, no big deal. It um, it gives me uh, credentials of being a naturopathic doctor, which uh, the reason we can offer something in, in this space of healthy aging is the fact that we look at many parts and we combine those many parts into something that's nice and digestible, often literally digestible, and helping individuals understand the changing body. This sounds like an after-school special. Their changing body in form in in terms of the physical, mental, and emotional perspective. 
So um, now that you know you can trust me, I've got some pieces of paper and uh, we're on a first name basis um, and everyone's appeased, we can dig in. And like I said, there's that handout so you can kind of go through that alongside me. We're learning together today, guys. Okay, so if anyone has heard of this, the Hayflick limit, it is a uh, theory and a concept and feel free to bust it out at your next uh, socially distanced gathering because nothing says I am cool like knowing the physiologic uh, theory that defines the inherent limit of our cellular repli replication. So this defines uh, aging on a tissue or cellular function, which then, as we know, uh, propagates to our organ tissues because again we're starting really small and if there is an inherent limit to the number of cellular replication cycles um, and that is defined by the fact that uh, every time you replicate your DNA uh, reproduces itself and it shortens a little so it shortens and it shortens and it shortens and it shortens and then oops okay it doesn't actually happen like that but the point is telomore shirt telomer shortening is um, responsible for changing a lot of gene activations and it it can also uh, activate and promote uh, cellular senescence which is the <clears throat> of course the uh, the ending of cellular replication so it goes into a dormant state so um, with that shortening uh, we we get changes in genetic expression um, and that loss of ability to divide and grow. This can also cause a lot of oxidative stress, um, which is, is, it makes it harder for us to attenuate or, or quench those free radicals that get formed. And what we get is an accumulation of inflammatory bio, biomarkers. So that's pretty intense and that's all happening on a cellular level. Okay, um, and a lot of the understanding of the Hayflick limit was, was started in animal studies, and the assessments there are, you know, um, understanding that there are these model organisms were used, usually Drosophila flies, and then over time it was uh, extrapolated to understand human cell tissues and and how they divide. But um, an example of understanding this is is uh, the insulin receptor sensitivity and they did a lot of work on that and understanding how that it, that receptor gene relates to mammalian longevity. So a lot of these life extension genes have now been defined and these pathways to um, promote the longevity of cellular health have been defined, which is a pretty cool place to be if, uh, you know, the fact that we know this about ourselves is, is pretty um, amazing. So what does the aging actually specifically mean to the DNA and what are those specific assaults that are happening um, on your DNA? Um, so we often hear about you know preventable and, and modifiable versus non-modifiable um, risk. And when we think about the modifiable and non-modifiable, I think we assume that genetics are just non-modifiable. And that is true to an extent, but I think what we need to think of it more as, um, you know, with epigenetics and genetic counseling, um, we can make more informed choices based on the, the genes are more of a blueprint for our, um, our makeup. And with epigenetics, we can modify that blueprint. We can, um, you know, add walls, take walls down. Again, I'm really all about these metaphors right now. Um, but AOR actually, who is is sponsoring this, and oh, I should also say that uh, the opinions and views expressed in this are not necessarily AORs. They are they are my own. Um, but uh, they did introduce a My Blueprint collaboration with DNA Labs out of Toronto. Um, and it, what it effectively does is create these tangible, actionable insights into the genetic function. So understanding that underlying um, framework in which our, our genes are 
are dictating our function, um, but then also how we can move ourselves towards genetic prosperity. So this idea, um, I think Dr. Robin Murphy gave a really great um, webinar on this. So just check back in the library log on on understanding genetic um, epigenetics and genetic testing in terms of functional medicine. So um, when we think about it in terms of aging, we if we're optimizing the activation and, and uh, usage of those genes, I guess you could say, um, we're really ensuring that uh, we are are limiting the, the modifiable risk factors that damage the DNA that then lead to that whole cascade of effects that ultimately leads to changes in physiology. So the changes in physiology are, um, well, we can go on about this, I could probably do a weekend course on this because there's just so much to cover. And when we're thinking about clients and patients, we want to be um, cognizant of their specific needs and their risk factors based on family history, but we can break it down into, I've broken it down into five uh, categories that really ensure that uh, we can at least hit those main categories and optimize this and really start supporting our health early on um, and, and make it so that we are able to, I guess, age well. Uh -huh. See what I did there? I brought it back around. So let's break down the impacts of aging on each of these uh, physiologic systems. Okay, so physiologic aging instead of, well, I guess we're moving slightly away from that, that cellular level, but we'll come back to it. Spoiler alert. But we're moving into the the um, the actual organ tissue systems. Okay, so if we think about metabolic changes, um, we need to assess the, the energy production, the toxic burden, and then how all of these are being removed and eliminated. Okay, so metabolic function is our ability to effectively produce energy from our fuel sources. So if we think of the, uh, the metabolic uh, or or energy production factories in our cells. Um, this is this is kind of our metabolism is our, our kitchen. It's where we're producing energy, and um, as we age, unfortunately, that kitchen, it's anything like mine, it's not getting used very often. It becomes less efficient, and we become more metabolically inflexible. Okay, you can't burn fuels as efficiently, and we're producing more of these fumes, and there's a less robust ventilation system that will help excrete a lot of these fumes. Um, so, so essentially, you're you're basking in a a toxic soup. I shouldn't laugh at that. That's not a great idea. But uh, what we really want is we to to re-ventilate and make sure that everything is smoothly flowing out and we're also able to efficiently burn the fuels that we are given and then I guess we give ourselves the fuels that we need okay so that's kind of the metabolic side of things digestive we know that there's so many changes that are happening in terms of our digestive capability and this feeds right in feeds <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that it feeds right into our metabolic capacities because obviously this is said fuel that you need to burn. So we really need to be able to synthesize this fuel. But uh, when we think of the aging gut, we think of a very slow sloth-like movement. It's sluggish. Um, stomach acid goes can go down. The motility, gut motility slows down. We have less of that interface for absorptive services don't have as many enzymes and the the uh, hormones that regulate our appetite change as well. <clears throat> then of course cognition when we're talking about aging well is so important because we think of the the physical changes that happen. Um, oh, I think that there's this misrepresentation in the media is that as we age we get very slow and we can't think as fast. We're not going to be able to effectively contribute to society um, but there we're going to go through some evidence that really challenges these kind of archaic notions of old means slow 
um, changes in physiology, the, the next category we're going to be looking at is, of course, the structural changes that are occurring, okay? Um, going back to that machine machinery analogy, it's um, these are systems or parts of the, the machine that are starting to break down because we're using it often so long. And um, we think about sarcopenia or the loss of muscle mass, bone density loss, arthritis and and liver spots oh my you know there's all these different structural changes that are happening in our body that it's like the scaffolding in in europe that you see everywhere well maybe not right now but you see that scaffolding that's trying to protect these beautiful buildings um sometimes our bodies need that additional scaffolding uh, and structural support um to to really help rebuild it Okay, and then finally we'll get into cardiovascular and respiratory function. Um, you guys are all probably thinking that was just the introduction. Yeah, we're going to do a deep dive into each of these, so strap in, people. Cardiovascular respiratory, we know that it's, you know, our heart is pump, pump, pumping away, and eventually it gets tired. And if it's not challenged regularly, you know, with daily exercise, um, it can... It, exacerbate or expedite that that tired feeling um, so we need to train it and we will talk about how to improve your cardiovascular and respiratory function okay let's dig into the metabolic factors so energy production cycles and the junk that gets produced from the just daily production of energy okay so extracting energy can get messy you know you can ask the oil industry, you can ask anyone, um, it can get messy. It can create fumes, um, much like me when I'm cooking, you know, again, I'm really not selling myself as a cook here, but that's fine. So like I said, we need to make sure we have a good ventilation system. So this removes all those toxic byproducts, clears out the junk. Energy production, as we know, happens in the mitochondria. Ooh, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cells. Um, having a well-functioning mitochondria means that you're able to efficiently produce energy and, uh, you know, whether that's fats, carbs, proteins, or whatever your fuel source is. So a lot of these mono-macro diets like ketogenic diet, Atkins, um, they make us fairly metabolically inflexible. And I'm not saying that there isn't a time and place for those specific diets, but uh, ultimately what we wanna be able to do is jump from, like a ninja, you jump from burning carbs and then you always go and you can burn fats really efficiently. You want to be able to be efficient. And if you're on this mono-macro diet, it's almost like your body needs to be reset in its ability to burn those different fuel types, which is why when people have been on keto for a really long time and they haven't carb cycled at all, they may become less efficient at that. So you want to be introducing, especially for women and our, our hormone cycles, you wanna be introducing cycles where you are moving in and out of um, ketogenesis very quickly and burning those, those carbs. So you will find that people who have a good, robust mitochondrial function, when they are um, burning, let's say they've, they're carb cycling, and then they want to get back into ketogenesis after they've carb cycled, they're, they can get back into that very quickly. Um, and, and with, I guess, a bit of a higher threshold with their, their complex carb load. Um, if it's functioning if their mitochondria is functioning very poorly, they're unable to do that switch as efficiently. So it'll take either longer or they have a very low tolerance for carbs before they can uh, get into keto. Okay, so that was a bit of a digression, but the point is uh, we wanna be really adept at, at burning these different fuels. And um, if we're not, then there's these more reactive oxygenated species that are going unquenched and we're susceptible to free radical accumulation and that specific damage. So when these clearance processes become really slow or we are inundated with these environmental toxins, we get more of that junk buildup. 
And the, the health consequences of this, of course, are we get more chronic diseases and we're finding more and more that a lot of them have origins in mitochondrial dysfunction. So think, think uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, metabolic syndrome, uh, cardiovascular disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and a lot of those neurodegenerative diseases, big mitochondrial component to that infertility. So basically, all I'm saying is protect the mitochondria. This beautiful organelle is uh, really, it's a, it's a gherkin-shaped organelle, and it's known as the mitochondria, for anyone who hasn't seen an image like this before. Um, and, and what does it do, you may ask? Well, it just improves your antioxidant function. Um, so, or sorry, how does one improve it? Uh, we, we want to improve our antioxidant function. So again, make that factory a little bit cleaner, add that ventilation system. So those are the CoQ10s, your vitamin E complexes, your um, alpha lipoic acids improve your metabolic flexibility. So we suggest, you know, having that whole foods diet, doing some HIIT exercises, um, and improving something called your NAD plus to NADH ratio. Um, and the purpose of this is to induce mitochondrial biogenesis. And before you panic and look at me all funny, I do have pictures. Yay, pictures. So, Let's break this down because you guys are probably panicking because you didn't realize this was going to be a first year biochem class and nor did I. Um, no one wants that. So let's highlight the function of the cellular currency known as NAD+. Okay, and I say cellular currency because it's not ATP, it's not the Canadian dollar, but it's like a British pound. So it still has value, it's still a currency, um, and it can turn on or off different genes. It can, um, the ratio of NAD plus to NADH, which we'll talk about in a second, can uh, function both as a, a and coenzymes, so it can make processes happen, but it can also be a co-substrate, so it gets consumed in the production of different processes. And ultimately, by supporting it, uh, we are, are going to be able to get, I, I guess, better and more efficient mitochondrial function. Okay, so other energy currencies, or you've probably heard of FAD+, plus, um, and again, they have other benefits outside of the ATP production. So we know that, you know, again, high school uh, biochem, it, that we have the citric acid cycle and everything, cellular respiration is all about building more ATP, the cellular currency, the cellular energy. But if we have all these other uh, types of currency, the NAD plus, you know, your British pounds, your US dollars, you can then convert that into ATP, all good, or you can uh, turn on a bunch of these life extension pathways. And when I say life extension pathways, it's more longevity pathways that, again, are preventing that DNA, excess DNA damage and supporting um, proper antioxidant function. Okay, so uh, a lot of there were a lot of early mouse models that had premature aging, and um, it really underscored that importance of NAD plus and NAD plus dependent proteins on age related me metabolic dysfunction. So there's been a lot of preclinical research, and I think now we're starting to move into um, the clinical side of things. But just know that in terms of the literature out there, it's still being developed in humans. So a lot of this is uh, more based on the physiology and the understanding of that. Okay, so we are, this is uh, more of the, the professional um, and and business to business type of webinar. So we're, I'm just gonna introduce some of the um, supplement opportunities that uh, you guys can start bringing in as we're relating to these larger processes and these larger conditions. So if we're thinking about increasing NAD production, we know that that can happen um, with, there's lots of supplements that are actually trying to uh, activate this and upregulate it. Um, so consider this molecule. So you can see here um, on the left side, 
there is uh, your your TCA cycle, your your citric acid cycle, and um, there's oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA, and they're feeding in, and um, ultimately you're producing more of these, uh, producing more ATP to then go into the electron transport chain. Again, this is getting really technical. I apologize. So oxaloacetate, uh, which I've circled here, is a um, key mediator in this cycle. So it combines with the acetyl-CoA and um, supplementing with exogenous oxaloacetate, like in the benagene, is, uh, I liken this to, you know those old timey water bucket wheels that keep filling with water and then it moves the wheel forward? This is akin to that. So you're dumping more of this substrate, the oxaloacetate in, and it keeps filling um, and moving the cycle forward. So you're you're now not rate limited by the amount of oxaloacetate. And um, it starts filling the bucket and and you can keep the cycle going effectively just increasing this NAD plus ratio. And here you can actually see um, the on the right side of your screen is the NAD as a coenzyme, like I mentioned. So that means it's required or, or it facilitates these processes. And you can see that in that state, you're increasing your energy production. So again, for a lot of those fatigued type patients and, and where energy production is an issue, this could be a really effective strategy. And then as a co-substrate on the other side, this is um, where it's actually being consumed to activate all these pathways. So many of you may have heard the sirtuin pathway, um, particularly with resveratrol, and um, how that's really important for cellular signaling. So if you think about this, this is a process that is consuming NAD. So you do still want to make sure that you have on the back end other processes that are going to support that. So if there's any abnormality in either the coenzyme ability or as a co-substrate ability, then you're going to see those mitochondrial dysfunction and the neurodegeneration and aging. So that that's where we're seeing uh, the relationship to more of a clinical setting. So I'm just going to go back to this, <clears throat> like a ninja, I'm going back to this slide to show you um, we have a lot of lifestyle mediators and and things that can impact this. So here you see the um, exercise caloric restriction, uh, sirtuin, the SATCs, so the sirtuin activating compounds uh, such as resveratrol. Um, and those, again, are all contributing to more NAD+. Plus. Um, when I say exercise, this is, again, that hit type exercise. Caloric restriction has some uh, evidence for, for increasing this and things like intermittent fasting. Um, what we're seeing is uh, mitochondrial diseases, obesity here. You can see that that's actually suppressing that NAD plus and, and of course, aging. Um, so when we have sufficient NAD plus, again, it can activate not just the sirtuin pathway, but there you can see in this slide, there's all these other pathways that it can, I love how I'm pointing at my screen, you guys can't see that. <clears throat> but the poly ADP ribose, the CADP, if you activate those, what you're doing right here at the end of this pathway is both sides, you're getting increased mitochondrial biogenesis. Yay, more mitochondria in the cell. And that can contribute to longevity and protection against uh, mitochondrial age-related disorders. So, protect the mitochondria. Okay. Um, in the the Benagene, I also just wanted to talk about its uh, its thermally stabilized oxaloacetate. So again, you're just supplementing with this oxaloacetate to keep that. TCA cycle moving forward. Um, also, it's very important to consider antioxidants in health. So when we're considering antioxidants and the role that it plays in nerve damage, um, 
here is just a little diagram of you have this electron loss um, pre and it creates a free radical and then those set off this chain reaction and it's uh, this is a very simplistic view but it's leading to damage and erosion of that cellular membrane whereas an antioxidant comes in and can kind of neutralize those free radicals. So we get um, endogenous free radical production, think glutathione, and then exogenous, um, and those usually are coming from supplementation, um, things like the vitamin E complex, like I mentioned, uh, alpha lipoic acid, uh, which is in this peak antioxidant support with PEA, which is a endogenous, so your body can produce it on its own, um, form of um, palmitol ethanolamide, also say that five times fast, it's fun. Um, and the combination of it is actually able to, um, one, activate your endocannabinoid system, which is also related to this mitochondrial dysfunction and there's an association there. But that's another webinar for another day because that can be, that will take a while. <clears throat> but the point is, uh, your endocannabinoid system can act as kind of a um, setting up the perimeter uh, for any tissue injury, inflammation, um, but it can also potentiate the action of a lot of antioxidants. So it's good to combine um, your endocannabinoid mimetics, you know, CBD oils, uh, PEA, all these things with antioxidants. <clears throat> Okay, um, a good example clinically, I guess, would be that, uh, you know, there's vitamin E supplementation can reduce a nerve damage, improve your cognitive performance um, after repetitive concussions. Um, and so it has this neuroprotective effect because it's effectively quenching these free radicals that usually cause so much damage. Okay, so let's understand um, we know on a cellular level we need to protect the mitochondria, but then we need to extrapolate this and understand what is our individual toxic burden because that will be the difference of accelerated aging. Like we see, um, you know, there there's some people you see who are, are 40 and may look much older because they have accelerated aging uh, just through their lifestyle, through, um, you know, having uh, so many plumes of walking through so many plumes of smoke. So um, on your little worksheet, take out a pen and paper, write down um, all of the threats you face on a daily basis, just in terms of toxic overload. So it's, you know, how many plumes of smoke are you walking through, the car exhaust, um, dust, spray paint, can, contaminants and microplastics in our water, water supply. Even our tea bags aren't safe, is nothing sacred anymore but we're always under this constant barrage of toxic assaults. And it makes you really never want to leave your house. Mm, is that too soon? That, that felt too soon. Yeah. Okay, so these are toxins we acquire through exposure. So normally our body's uh, hardest working organ, no big deal, is the liver. And I know you're not supposed to choose your favorite organ, it's like choosing a favorite child, but let's be honest, the liver works the hardest. It has 500 plus functions and it's able to process all these toxins from medications and processes foodstuffs and it packages it all nicely and uh, it can go through, deliver to, you know, for wonderful excretion pathways. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the clearance side of this slide. You know, liver metabolism, renal excretion, digestion, respiratory, and thermoregulatory. These are pathways or excretion um, pathways that enable us to manage a toxic load. Okay, so it's really important that obviously those are flowing. Okay, so as we age, the clearance part becomes a little bit slower and the exposure part becomes a little bit higher, right? Because you're around longer and these things start to accumulate in your system or in fat cells. Um, and so you're just, again, like I said, we don't want to be stewing in any toxic soups, which sounds really gross. Um, we know that renal blood flow, there, there was a study on this a few years ago, can um, decrease with aging and that can be associated with atherosclerotic plaques 
formation um, and uh, damage to renal arteries or other vascular diseases. So our kidney mass is also decreasing in size as we age, and that's uh, progressively faster after 65. So again, you're getting that smaller kidney mass. Uh, there is one pathway that is starting to slow down. I alluded before to the, the digestion becoming more sluggish. Um, and so again, you're, you're not as efficient as eliminating. Okay. So the great escape, we got to get things moving. And as Shrek said, it's better out than in. Um, and yeah, that's right. It was a serious scientific presentation and uh, we just got a Shrek reference. So this is 2020 people. So let's look at each of these. Poop. As NDs, we kind of have this weird, mild obsession with bowel movements. And, um, and of course, we want to encourage regular bowel movements, two to three a day. We want them not too soon after we eat and not too late after we eat. So about an hour or two after meals is ideal. Um, you know, if it's too fast, you're not getting all those nutrients. And if it's too slow, you might get a risk for dysbiosis. So you have to get, um, you know, the, the good bacteria aren't where they're meant to be. And uh, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we're, we're pooping because the, the feces are actually a way to eliminate, again, those wastes from that toxic burden, regulate our hormones. So after hormones are, are being used, they get metabolized, as we know, and then they need to be repackaged excess cholesterol, um, it helps regulate our hydration status. So suffice to say, it's always great to poop, okay? Helping have uh, regular bowel movements, we will get into the, this a little bit more in the digestive component, but I, I wanna talk here is, um, let's make sure we're having healthy bathroom habits and encouraging individuals to develop some sort of um, uh, strategy or or bathroom hygiene so um, you know properly sit and be in that relaxed parasympathetic state is really important um, and before starting any cleanses for the liver I think it's really important that we all encourage people to to make sure that each of these pathways are moving before we even start that. Okay, um, so so again, the fibers, and I'll get into this in the next slide. So, uh, P urine is so important uh, in terms of uh, elimination pathways because, as we know, it can regulate our blood pressure. It's also important for um, clearance of a lot of medications and uh, as I just mentioned literally not about five minutes ago uh, renal function declines with age so uh, the drug often there's uh, increased polypharmacy as we age too so it seems like you need the kidneys to clear the drugs but you have more drugs and then it it's just this cycle and it keeps going. So let's start young in making sure that we're uh, engaging in healthy uh, urine. So again, not necessarily holding it for a really long time because that can cause uh, overactive bladder or dysfunction of that bladder, um, those neurological pathways that regulate our bladder and the urges to pee. So um, we want to not necessarily have to be on these medications really, really long term because that's again an additional um, load for our kidney as well as our liver. Um, and of course, uh, for women, really making sure there's healthy pelvic floor, especially um, during and after pregnancy, and and uh, refortifying that pelvic floor so we're not getting any um, herniations. Okay, sweat. This, um, your your body is using, utilizing, wow, oh my goodness, words. Okay, your body is utilizing sweat as a method of excreting toxins uh, through the skin, but also more, uh, more so for thermoregulation. Um, but oftentimes uh, also with, with 
sweating and exercise, we really want to make sure we're hitting that at about 50 to 80 percent of your VO2 max. So again, everyone can just 220 minus your age, that'll give you your, your VO2 max and then 80 percent of that. So encouraging specific targets instead of saying exercise. You know, let's have a specific target. Um, and then breathing is always fun. Um, this excretion pathway not only gets you oxygen, but of course it's helping us release CO2 and um, hyperventilation can cause this respiratory acidosis. And we want to consider the shape and position of our lungs when we're breathing and encouraging someone to take um, recommendations of breathing. So um, they can, you can just put a hand on your chest right now and hand on your belly and see which one is um, moving more, okay? So the idea is really pushing our belly out and flattening that diaphragm so that you get greater uh, lung volume or lung capacity <laughs> by, by creating that space in that chamber and then taking nice deep breaths. Um, alternating nostril breathing is a technique that was is used quite a lot in Ayurvedic medicine um, and opens up more of those pathways and that rest and digest. Okay. So um, supplementation for each of those elimination pathways I think can come in handy for a specific period of time. I'm a lazy supplementer and I know this is being put on by a supplement company, but um, hey, I, I really feel like our bodies are fairly good at doing what they do, but sometimes for a defined period of time, they need help. And so what supplementation does is acts as a, a crutch for those short periods of time. It's not, you shouldn't be doing this forever and you should constantly be reassessing the need for that. As we age, some of those measures may, may appear more long-term. Okay, so it's having to supplement with fiber may become more regular. So supplementation um, can be initiated when you're not finding that uh, those elimination pathways are as uh, nimble as you want them to be. So we have the liver support. This has um, botanicals as well as botanicals and herbs um, for that support both the phase one and phase two elimination, as well as antioxidant support, um, particularly important for that endocrine function. So really good for, um, you know, when you're actually starting those, those cleanse type processes. But of course, we know our liver is always detoxing. It's always detoxifying. So uh, introduce that, you know, at any point, even if there is some sort of chronic disease, that you think has uh, caused more of a, a liver burden, okay? Um, <clears throat> MCP, this powder, uh, if anyone's tried it, tastes, it tastes special. It, it doesn't taste great, but here's what's important. Modified citrus pectin um, is, is an important cellular regulator, but it also binds to a lot of heavy metals, things like lead and mercury, so it can actually bind and help excrete um, these heavy metals. So it's also used kind of as a, a detoxifying agent. Soluble fiber. So uh, soluble fibers are important to have low FODMAP type fiber. So this is a hydrolyzed guar gum. Um, particularly important for, you know, the, the individuals who are with SIBO protocols, um, IBS patients, and, and having the hydrolyzed guar gum is, is particularly good for the cholesterol management side of things. So it's a fiber source that is helping on the soluble fiber side of things to, so it's not necessarily bulking the stool, but it is pulling more of those uh, excretion materials, the, the junk if you will and it's pulling it out and um, so it won't necessarily dehydrate you but you still always want to be drinking the fibers with lots of water okay and then from the respiratory side of things making sure there's proper clearance um, and acetylcysteine is a really important one precursor to um, intracellular glutathione which is that that body super antioxidant um, but it's also important for respiratory health because it is a mucolytic, so it can break down a lot of those 
mucous adhesions um, and and so there's more and more studies in how we can use it for respiratory health which is particularly important at this time okay help your gut save your butt let's focus on digestion i think we can all get on board with that so uh di digestion um decreases with age okay there's less stomach acid so you're at risk for reflux uh worse protein breakdown um there's less bile production so uh, management and metabolism of fats becomes a little bit uh more difficult less pancreatic enzyme function which is again all digestion of all all uh food becomes a little bit slower and there's that slowing of the intestinal movement, okay? So if we break it down into the little stomach acid and enzyme production, the motility, there's a decline in the absorptive surfaces. So the villi, there may be more villi damage. There may be uh, less, the, the borders are less fortified. So there's more of a leaky gut happening. Um, movement of, of more foreign bodies can cause more inflammation and autoimmune dysfunction and then of course the changes in appetite so here i've just listed the sequelae or the uh i guess uh concern things we need to be concerned about for each of these as we're aging okay so it's it's obviously very important to address the um impaired mmc the migrating motor complex so these are the muscular contractions that keep our food moving unidirectionally through the digestive tract. Um, hyperstimulation is damaging because then you're getting insufficient absorption. We've seen this with deficiencies in vitamin B12 occurring. Um, also, you know, inhibited iron absorption, but um, and it can also really harm your microbiome. But when it's very slow, that's when you're getting those dysbioses um, because again there's fecal material sitting in in a particular region maybe more in your small intestine with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth the SIBO um, so again those bacteria are now relocating further up your digestive tract when they are meant to be obviously in your your large intestine so these will exacerbate any weight fluctuations, um, hormone and immune dysfunctions because there's such a close and important link between your digestive function and these other systems. So that's why you gotta help your, help your gut. It'll save your butt, okay? So the treatment approach is simple. Or, I mean, I like to keep it simple because I don't like to complicate things. Um, really identify and remove those dietary irritants and we want to uh, select the, a well-balanced whole food diet so there may be times when you are switching the type of diet um, maybe it starts with a more of a low FODMAP diet for the symptom management while you're doing eradication and maybe a complete elimination diet to identify again the dietary irritants you may be doing um, some testing for that um, and of course as you remove the causative or identify and remove the causative factor you then have to heal any of that inflammation um, and very important to restore a balanced microbiome and regulate those bowel movements so again get everything moving but sometimes you can't get it moving until you've you know done the healing first and then and then at that point it's beneficial to test and correct those nutrient deficiencies i mean you can test earlier on but if you correct the nutrient deficiencies a little bit uh later you know if you're trying to supplement uh in a highly toxic environment or highly inflamed environment you are reducing the absorptive capacity and if you're aging you already have slightly reduced absorptive capacity anyway so you know, you're just really putting yourself at a deficit and ultimately paying for a supplement that you cannot utilize. So correct, actually target and correct the deficiencies once you've healed the gut and you can actually extract some benefit from that. Otherwise, go for more of an IV option if you can. 
Okay. In terms of what to eat and when, um, we'll talk about timing of meals in terms of your MMT, but what to eat is a, a low, you're, you're just ultimately trying to reduce inflammation. So that will vary from person to person, but limiting those processed foods. So fruit consumption, for example, had a 36% reduced rate for all-cause dementia. Vegetable had a 44% reduced risk of all-cause dementia. Fish was also a 44% reduction of all-cause dementia. Omega-3 was a 54% for all-cause uh, dementia and 73% for Alzheimer's disease. So we're getting to the cognitive side of things, but the point is pretty important. Those are some, some pretty good numbers. Um, olive oil risk was 14% for all-cause um, dementia. And then, of course, all of these also have cardiovascular benefits as well, but we're just more talking for the cognitive side of things. Okay, so intermittent fasting um, and caloric restriction way back when I started this, which now may or may not feel a very long time ago, um, we were talking about the, uh, the NAD plus ratio and increasing uh, fasting and caloric restriction to increase that. But uh, we also know that it, having properly timed meals uh, where you're separating them by a few hours also helps reset your migrating motor complex. So not eating, you know, those grazers that are constantly putting something in their system, that bolus of food is is moved but it's not weighted enough to stimulate those muscle contractions to move everything forward so it's not weighted enough to stimulate a migrating motor complex re reaction um, but it is it's still causing some you know release of enzymes and it, it's small enough to cause an issue but not big enough to cause movement okay so grazers you want to avoid that grazing and have um, you know, it, it can be snacks, but they should be separated by a period of time. Okay, this is with weighted food for the MMC. Okay, caloric restriction has uh, memory enhancing effects. When we say caloric restriction, that's a 30% reduction in calories. You always want to be careful with patients who do have a history of um, orthorexia, anorexia, or eat any eating disorder, because when we say caloric restriction, it's you're still maintaining the calories required for for living, but um, you're just reducing uh, somewhat, particularly in those who are eating more processed foods. Okay, um, with that caloric restriction, it was it had improved memory um, after three months of of a thirty percent reduction. Um, and and this was in overweight individuals, improved insulin sensitivity, and reduced uh, CRP marker. Okay, my good friend, Dr. Elson Glenn, was quoted this, uh, you just can't go when you're thinking about stuff. When you're stressed, we know that it impacts your digestion because uh, cortisol blocks that rest and digest pathway. You're now in more of a sympathetic, activated state and you need to be in that calm restful digestion so really sitting down activating your vagus nerve which is that primary nerve for your parasympathetic system um, which runs through your neck so making sure that you're opening up that space um, you know yoga and stretches people who tend to put a lot of stress in their shoulders uh, can't can't digest properly so stress is a huge component and sleep is a huge component. So you have to regulate your sleep cycles. Melatonin, um, that sleep hormone is related to the regulation of carolin, which is the hunger hormone. Okay, so it tells the brain when we're hungry, but when melatonin is low or dysregulated, its release is inhibited. So we're not getting those satiety signals. Leptin as well, we're not getting satiety or hunger signals the way we should be receiving them. So as we explain this to patients um, or customers, we are understanding that risk for obesity, that, that correlation between obesity and insomnia. And then, um, and again, this was a study published in Obesity Journal in 2020, talking about uh, circadian rhythm, substrate oxidation, and hormonal regulators. So 
sleep becomes so important. So we shift the conversation to sleep hygiene. So shutting off the electronics, having ambient light, um, and sleeping on the right side again, opening up those, those vasovagal exercises, doing gargling in the morning, um, having a good cortisol awakening response, which if you're not familiar with, we uh, do have some discussions on that in past webinars. So again, the stress component is really, really important. Things like zinc carnosine can also help uh, with the, the sleep and app, particularly the appetite side of things. Okay. Um, and then melatonin supplementation, again, we're always going low and titrating up that dose, uh, particularly effective for shift workers, uh, jet lag. And uh, I would say when we're introducing melatonin, um, of course, we know that there is a, an adverse effect of, you know, the very groggy, vivid dreams, and that can be mitigated, again, by, by more liquid forms or um, attenuating like I said so you start with a lower dose but you only titrate up until um, there's been a 30% reduction in those those symptoms which is sometimes it's hard for for a patient to be like yeah that was 30% reduced that's fine okay making our way through this I got this okay cognition and memory so uh, there are age-related changes. Um, obviously, as we age, our, our brain size is shrinking. So uh, brain atrophy is a normal part of aging. However, the region in which it's occurring and whether it's um, cerebral atrophy, which is more of the nonspecific finding that does occur in, in normal aging, um, or if it's distinctive patterns, um, and again, the, the rate is very important, um, but you can have brain injuries that can that can increase that cerebral atrophy um, or neurodegeneration. If it's a specific pattern, um, such as it's just involved in the hippocampus or amygdala areas, um, those are early markers of Alzheimer's disease. So those distinctive patterns of atrophy are different from more of the global um, non-specific findings so first there needs to be that assessment so after after 40 the rate of shrinkage can increase but we can uh we'll talk about strategies to improve that in a second so i scare you first and then i give you a treatment it's just how i work so the changes of two grams per year from 26 to 80 and then and after 80 that five grams per year after 80 uh increases like I said, they're now looking at more research saying maybe it's actually 40 where the rate slightly increases from that two grams, okay? Um, when I'm talking about those distinctive patterns, of course, our hippocampus is related to memory and learning. So if there's any hippocampal atrophy, that's, um, that's pretty important in terms of picking up new skills and why some people still have long-term memory and long-term um, capability, but then their ability to learn new things may start to degenerate at a certain time, but that could be indicative of, of the specific atrophy. And then neurodegeneration can be accelerated by uh, reactive oxygen species causing damage. So again, lack of antioxidants can, can cause that. Um, injury, traumatic brain injury, uh, chemical exposure, and amyloid plaque. Okay, so there seems to be this uh, horrible idea, like I said, that that our perceptual abilities, as we age, um, we're losing all our mental faculties and we're, again, no longer able to uh, function. Now, yes, there is a change in cognitive capacity. However, um, it doesn't necessarily mean cognitive decline per se. You can see here that a lot of our... Um, perceptual abilities, visual abilities, they peak at different times. So these are our mental faculties, they're peaking at different times. Um, around age 53, uh, our verbal memory is peaking around, um, sorry, verbal ability peaks around 60. And that makes sense because as you can see, I'm not speaking so well today, so I just have to wait a little while. Because 
verbal memory, verbal ability, all these things, they, they do peak at different times. And then they, yes, they, there is a natural decline. However, um, it doesn't have to be, we're, we're looking at rates of decline when we're thinking about aging well. So there's the normal aging process, and then there's age-associated memory impairment. And then uh, you can see here with, um, you can expedite that with the, the mild cognitive impairment, and then we're getting even more uh, higher rate with Alzheimer's disease. So what should, uh, or what I guess we anticipate is normal changes or things like attention span, um, the, the, the long-term cued responses, like vocabulary, verbal knowledge, long-term memory, those, are, those should stay the same with slight variations. Um, but the things that are, are really quickly changing is more that short-term memory, processing speed, and um, the acute reaction. So we, we do see that change. And again, it's not that we cannot process that information. It just takes slightly longer. Okay, and again, here are the things where there's the normal aging, uh, retrieval deficit, sometimes it, you need to be cued, which is why multiple choice tests tend to be a little bit easier because you need a cue, so, but you can re, you can get there. Um, whereas with Alzheimer's disease, there's more of a global impact, so you're also getting um, personality changes, apathy, withdrawal, the anomia, visual spatial function. So, and unfortunately, anyone who's uh, supported anyone uh, suffering from Alzheimer's knows that there's there's quite a lot uh, going on there and it can be quite debilitating in terms of loss of function so if we're moving in the the normal aging side of things and then just optimizing that function we can start to to see benefits so I talked before about the caloric restriction diet in terms of improving learning and, and working memory um, and that was again with the 30% less cal calories. What that caloric restriction can also do is increase the uh, production of this little compo compound. <laughs> the image is not the compound, but if anyone knows what it is, first of all, you get five points for Gryffindor. If you don't know what it is, it is lion's mane, this beautiful um, mushroom, and uh, it is also known to increase your brain-derived neurotropic factor. So this is a neurohormone, so it acts as a neurotransmitter and a hormone, similar to something like melatonin, and it's essential to the structure of nerve cells, and it stimulates that neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So yay. Um, caloric restriction is, is uh, kind of associated with that exercise. And like I said, the mushroom extract, which is this beautiful lion's mane. It just looks so like you just want to rub your hand through it. Okay, exercise in terms of cognitive function. So we've talked about it already, and that's the beauty of naturopathic medicine. So many things help for many things. Exercise will help with many things, but it is important to be able to speak to uh, the benefits for each particular uh, risk factor or idea. So physical and mental exercise um, can help increase the size of the hippocampus. So within a year, exercise increased the size by 2%, whereas normally there's a 1% to 2% decrease per year. So you're almost um, combating that, that reduction uh, with regular exercise. So this is, um, it was a 28-day study and they had I mean, it was a year long study, but they had started with 28 days to develop that habit. And it was aerobic exercise, 30 minutes, five times a week, reduced risk by 50% for Alzheimer's disease. That's pretty impressive. So let's, you know, start implementing it. Strength training, also really important. We'll talk about that more in the structure function side of things, but strength training for bone density, but for cognitive ability, it's really important for cerebellar function, so that balance and coordination exercises are really important. Okay, so you wanna be mixing up the types of exercises. When I say mental exercises, these are puzzles, these are uh, word-finding games, 
um, and logical puzzles. I know there's lots of those apps right now that test your uh, cognitive function in relation to people your own age, and it's fascinating, and you can play those for a really long time. So I don't know if anyone has any time, if they have to be at home or anything. So it also improves the mood, brain function, um, and increases that BDNF, this guy. Okay, I know we're getting a little bit tight on time, but I'm gonna power through. So the active uh, trial was a large scale trial where they used memory reasoning, um, speed of information processing and games to see how um, the, what changes are happening. So a training group where they were doing exercises um, showed improvement over five years. So the first one, the first study, we saw benefits within a year, but over five years, um, again, you're just gonna see it even better. So this is why all of these things, we just need to start earlier and earlier and earlier, okay? Help ourselves. I'm gonna skip this slide. Okay, so structural changes. So um, this is uh, obviously a category that gets talked about the most when we think about aging and these anti-aging um, movements. So uh, muscle mass decreases as we age, joint pain, obviously there's more arthritis uh, seen that wear and tear on the joints um, and, and back pain. We also have that increased risk for falls and fractures. So bone density becomes really important. So we want to maintain that balance of the, the building, so the cells that help build all of these structures and functions, even our skin, and then also the breakdown processes. So we make sure that the, the breakdown processes aren't uh, faster than the building processes. Okay, so we need to make sure we have those building blocks. That would be things like protein for muscle and bone, um, the calcium, the, we also want to make sure we're not, uh, again, increasing the breakdown with uh, unbalanced blood sugar, we also, uh, or infection, that can be a big one that, that can cause issues. So again, we, we really need to start, a lot of, in terms of structural change especially, that is so important to start. The earlier you start, the, the better you are going to be off the better off you're going to be wow see visual ability verbal ability <laughs> help me <laughs> okay sarcopenia so this is the uh the denigration of its age related muscle loss it is a natural part of aging after 30 we lose as much as three to five percent now that's a range so of course you always want to be on the lower end of the range um, per decade. So again, we're seeing that that range in individuals. How we can support this is uh, protein intake. So a recent study in nutrients actually found uh, 1 to 1 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight um, for older adults who do resistance training can slow this sarcopenic loss. Um, and then epicatechins, these are the things that are found in green tea, um, dark chocolate. So you can uh, look at uh, supplements that do have catechins in them. Um, when we're talking about protein, make sure it's a complete protein and it's not exacerbating. If we go back to the digestive function, it's not causing a lot of inflammation. So if people do have a pea protein allergy or a whey protein allergy, just be being cognizant of that. Um, and then we will talk about the nitric oxide uh, component in a minute, but really ensuring that we're getting proper circulation and blood flow to certain areas. Okay, so that was that was the muscle loss kind of side of things. Bone health. Bone health begins in your youth. Twenty-year-old women need to start taking uh, proper support because, as we know, uh, postmenopausally there is also a um, reduction in bone density. That's why we need women to get regular, not regular, but um, they should get a DEXA scan um, and and understand their bone density. So we have the building blocks of bones, we have the bone cell regulators, 
and then we have uh, the the hormonal responses. Okay, so it's really important to that kind of mitigate that. So it's important to make sure we're consuming enough of the calcium, magnesium, strontium, boron, phosphorus, zinc, silica, uh, collagen protein in the right doses, which is why even with the ortho bone and the bone basics, they are fairly high doses a day, you know, six capsules a day. I know that's a capsule burden, but if they're not able to get sufficient amounts from their diet, then they, then this is the trade-off, right? You just have to really imbibe that importance of of uh, subscribing to that proper dose okay the regulators these themselves so with bone cell regulators we we know you know our, our parathyroid hormone because that release of calcium from the bone and then calcitonin is allowing it to be deposited on bone but then also when we think of bone cell regulators these are the things that help us absorb and utilize calcium so vitamin k2 so important if you're taking the mk4 form you want to be getting at those high doses of 45 milligrams a day and you want to do that uh multiple dosing so because it has quite a low half-life uh vitamin d3 we obviously know for mood and uh seasonal affective disorder and immune function but it's very very important for that calcium absorption uh vitamin c e you know all these all these cofactors that are also important for utilization of these building blocks and getting those to the right place weight bearing exercise um oh sorry actually going back to the bone cell regulators we know the osteoclasts are the ones that are kind of breaking it down osteoblasts build it up um in the advanced bone protection, there is milk basic protein, which is actually known to inhibit osteoclast activity and increase osteoblast activity. So I was liking that too. Th those are the workers, so you're supporting the workers, but then you also need the materials, which are the building blocks. So pairing an advanced bone protection with something like the bone basic. So those are the, the that's a nice balance. And of course, weight bearing exercise. We talked about it in cognitive health. Well, guess what? It's also really important for your bone health. So peak rates of uh, bone mineral density and muscle mass gain, uh, we really want to be getting, you know, that three times a week, some like lift heavy things. It's always great. I heard that at a conference and all the simple, beautiful, done. Joint support. So obesity uh, is a, a key concern one there's higher load on the joints um also there is more inflammation that's being produced so um when we're thinking of osteoarthritis uh, rheumatoid arthritis things that are uh, degrading the joint space we want to one make sure that there's enough materials like the hyaluronic acid the msm glucosamine that that can actually uh, coat those joint spaces, but we're also reducing the inflammation um, and the pressure on that joint. So with the inflammation, um, NF-kappa-B and NERF-2, these, well, the NF-kappa-B, we want to uh, stimulate, you can use natural botanical herbs like the uh, curcumins, boswellia, you can activate your endocannabinoid system to help support uh, those anti-inflammatory measures. Increasing range of motion as soon as possible um, to, to ensure that you're not getting, again, those joints locked in those spaces, stability exercises. Um, I do a lot of acupuncture for the scar tissue and joint support, and then also making sure that those muscles aren't then overcompensating. Um, and then, like I said, the components of joints, MSM, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, and collagen. Okay, get into skin quickly. Skin is oftentimes related to, uh, in the beauty industry, it's always anti-aging is related to just make your skin beautiful and don't worry about what's going on, on the inside. Your skin is a canary in the mine. It tells you, what a cute little canary. It tells you if you have digestive, upset um, or if there's something going on that's a bit more serious your skin can kind of be the thing that that shows it so as we age we're getting a thinning of the epidermis um, and that dermis so um, that can be related to decreased sex hormones um, decreased number of nerve endings it becomes drier 
um, we're getting gradual loss of that skin barrier and uh, it changes so we're getting a reduction of that collagen so again structurally we're we're starting to it's starting to degrade so intrinsic factors there's intrinsic aging and uh, exogenous or extrinsic aging so intrinsic would be your regular metabolism and day-to-day -day aging which can then cause this cellular damage exogenous sources would be you know radiation air pollution uv light cigarette smoke so if we think of extrin extrinsic aging, um, there is a lot of oxidative damage that tends to be that underlying mechanism. And if we go way back to when we were talking about why oxidative damage is so bad, it's those free radicals, um, those reactive oxygen species that need to be quenched. So um, we can also have uh, advanced glycated end products. These are large sugar molecules attached to um, to proteins that can then clog we, we think of that in our eye it can also cause a lot of um, skin damage and it will accelerate collagen loss so it's really important to again one limit the exposure and this comes back to exposure but then also clearance and healing so collagen degradation, um, it loses that structural integrity. So you can see here, the, the, this is the healthy side of things, lots of strong collagen and elastin fiber, fiber, fibers and the fibroblasts. And then on the other side here, we, we just don't have the same amount. So collagen supplementation can um, be quite effective just in re recalibrating this. Okay, with skincare, I would say you know keep it really simple, hygiene tips. Um, we don't want to. We want to avoid those face washes that are too alkalinizing or drying. Um, warm water, not hot. A lot of people tend to wash their face with too hot water, and then it again. If you already have that decreased skin barrier, uh, back there, um, then you're not able to hold on to that hydration as much, which is why now they're touting all this hyaluronic acid be able to retain um, that that night's moisture barrier um, use simple simple uh, makeup removers you know olive oil is really effective <laughs> to remove eye makeup um, washing brushes and that good hygiene okay there's a lot that can be used I just made this list uh, for a patient a while ago that was just here are things that are in your cabinet right now that can help with the sun protection Okay, so you can you can put the aloe vera plant on. Um, we did a podcast actually about that, so you can check that out on um, sun damage and skin health. And uh, there's a lot of topical botanical remedies. I really like Avena sativa, so oat for for that cooling, itchy, irritated skin. Um, neem gets used a lot in Ayurvedic medicine. Curcumin. Curcumin is again great antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and if we're talking about topically, um, it's used in Indian ceremonies before weddings to beautify the bride. It's called a haldi ceremony, and they 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 knew what they were talking about. So they uh, it's that nice golden rich colors turmeric, and it it has that anti-inflammatory probably property but when taken orally you get this uh, systemic benefit with oral supplementation you really want to make sure it's that free form um, and you're able to to actually get it into your systems for optimal bioavailability cardiovascular you guys were so close we we're so close we got this so cardiovascular and respiratory function so as we age we know uh like i said there's increased endothelial dysfunction so you get more arterial stiffness um the increase in pulse wave velocity so it's it's also that the mechanisms and regulation is uh starting to decline so it's the the pacemaker cells are starting to get a little bit tired um and then arterial inflammation, which we know can increase that oxidative stress. And then you have a decreased amount of nitric oxide uh, production. So nitric oxide, super important. Um, we know it as important for vasodilation, improves that blood flow, blood, 
flood pressure um, because again as you're increasing the, the size of those blood vessels you get uh, less pressure fancy that so traditionally we always thought of nitric oxide production as as being in the L-arginine pathway, and then this enzyme NOS uh, can convert it into the nitric oxide. Supplementing with nitric oxide on its own is not effective. It's very, it's uh, too transient, it's short-lived, and it's um, not stable in any way. But we know we need nitric oxide for all of these host of conditions. So it, it is effective in that because one, you're also helping deliver uh, better oxygen, uh, oxygenation to tissues, um, better circulation, removal of inflammatory byproducts. Again, nitric oxide could almost also be used in that um, clearance slide. So uh, nitric oxide, super important. If we think about it with the L-arginine pathway, um, we are, are limited because L-arginine, while effective at increasing your nitric oxide production, often used in erectile dysfunction, it, it is uh, important. However, it has to be uh, within oxygenated uh, conditions. So the environment is really important um, and that can limit its use. So um, dietary nitrates go on, undergo a reduction oxidation reduction pathway so they go nitrate nitrite and then nitric oxide so it's three steps instead of this one step pathway um, but it can be done under anoxic conditions so you don't necessarily need the same oxygen capacity so if you're working out for example this could be a good thing to take before okay so dietary nitrates um, have been shown to reduce systolic blood pressure by as much as 10 milligrams um, of mercury and diastolic by about 8 milligrams. So that can be really effective and important, especially if we're thinking long-term strategies for someone who already has high blood pressure. <clears throat> okay, it's improving the oxygen delivery to all the organs um, and improves uh, the blood vessel function. So you're reducing clot formation, you're preventing platelets from clumping together, you're just, again, keeping everything moving. Like Shrek said, it's better opening, better moving, just keep it all flowing, okay? So I just wanna summarize, um, and we'll be able to get to a few questions, but in terms of the metabolic function, um, <clears throat> really the key take home points are, are protect that mitochondria, and improve the NAD plus to NADH ratio, um, and then antioxidants that really help negate those uh, reactive oxygen species. Assess your toxic burden, decrease your exposure when possible, and increase your clearance. Okay, pretty simple. Digestive, promote that optimal nutrient absorption. You wanna, I understand where those limitations are coming from. So any inflammation from foods, any uh, types of medications that are worsening that, try to address that. Then you need to heal the gut, replenish the microbiome, and then replete the nutrients. Um, really following a, a stepwise kind of low, uh, low inflammatory diet but then also timing of meals becomes really important you can start to implement the intermittent fasting so you can do 16 and 8 so 16 hours fasting and then eight hours uh, feeding time um, for the migrating motor complex making sure that you're um, having you know two hours between actual meals um, to again keep everything moving in that unidirectional way Cognitive, increase the, the brain drive neurotrophic factor um, with the exercise, caloric restriction, um, protect the brain function with regular exercise, implement that as early as possible um, with as much regularity as possible. Cognitive uh, exercises and of course, you know, good Mediterranean diet with their healthy fats. Structurally, uh, reduce the sarcopenia with a sufficient protein. Uh, consider epicatechins. Bone health with the weight-bearing exercise. Also regulate the bone builders and the bone breakers. 
reduce the joint inflammation um, in terms of pain management and worsening of condition with things like curcumin um, and fish oils, mitigate uh, the accelerated extrinsic skin aging, make sure you're protecting uh, from with sunscreens, topical protection, as well as internal support through the digestion will have a benefit on skin. And then cardiovascular and respiratory really improve your nitric oxide production. Okay, thank you so much for being patient. And, and as we work through that, I'm just gonna check here if we have any questions. Oh, someone couldn't hear me. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at my joke. Uh, do you, percentages of decrease uh, for all cause dementia of certain foods? So fruits was, oh, do I remember this? Yeah. Let's go back here. Structural changes. I'm going to say that's an exercise. Yeah. Yeah, so let's see here, the exercise. Uh, vegetables was 44%, omega-3 was 44%. Where did I have this cognitive changes? Sorry, this is probably making everyone dizzy. Uh, 34% with fruit. Ah, sorry guys, computer's going a little crazy. Okay, yeah, 36% with fruit consumption for all-cause dementia, 44% with vegetable consumption, fish consumption was 44, fish oil, omega-3s was 54% for all-cause and 73 for um, AD. Olive oil was 14%. Uh, peanut oil was 12%, but there is a concern for uh, sensitivity there. And then omega-6 increased risk uh, by 112%, if not compensated with your omega-3s. <clears throat> Pretty interesting there. Oh, sleeping on the right-hand side, why did I mention that? Uh, we were talking about if strategies for your um, vasovagal response so uh your vagus nerve support resetting that tone um there is a suggestion that you can sleep more on your right side good job amanda getting the lion's mane i'm proud of you i'm glad that you knew what that was okay thank you guys so much uh the next uh webinar is september 8th dr sarah zedek is going to be doing some strategies for helping children take their supplements making supplementation fun for kids um if you have any additional questions please feel free to email uh, marketing at aor.ca and there will be a recorded version of this so you can check that out and thank you. Have a wonderful, magical day. Bye.